Okay, if we could please turn to the book of Revelation and the eighth chapter, Revelation chapter eight. I'm going to read the entire chapter. We're going to call this uh, section Environmental Nightmare. <laughs> and really, it is going to be a, a nightmare for the environmentalist movement uh, when you see the judgments that are unfolded in this chapter. So beginning in verse one, it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and it was, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so that the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for the third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And again, God will indeed add a blessing to this precious portion of scripture. And so we begin in, in verse one with uh, just a kind of maybe a reminder of the outline that we mentioned last time. Uh, we saw in verses one and two, there's silence in heaven. And then verse 3 through 5, their service at the altar. And then verse 6 through 13, we're going to see storms on the earth. Silence in heaven, service at the altar, storms on the earth. Beginning with silence in heaven. And we began uh, looking at this last time, that uh, this calm before the storm. After, uh, again, just to think of this, silence in heaven for half an hour. Remember that heaven is filled with noise, not not bad noise, but the, the wonderful noise of the worthiness of the Lamb being proclaimed and holiness of God being proclaimed. And we saw a glimpse of that in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And then all of a sudden, after all of this wonderful uh, praise and adoration being brought to, to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb and the holiness of God being proclaimed, all of a sudden, silence. And you can just imagine what that must be like and and silence for 30 minutes it, it's it, our world is full of noise and it's it's hard to imagine 30 minutes of silence uh, just complete silence but there's silence in heaven and we said that it is a thought that there's calm before the storm which is about to break on planet earth and also the the seventh seal has been opened and so now this title deed that uh, was on the the hand of the one who sat on the throne is now being fully opened and can be read and of course it's giving uh, the the earth uh, giving the 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 uttermost parts of the earth for for Christ's possession uh, the heathen for his inheritance 
And this is what it's all about. But of course, we have this dilemma of he's now got this title deed, but there are these earth dwellers who are still on the earth, and they're still saying, we will not have this man. <laughs> we don't want him. And so there has to be a removal of these squatters who think the earth be belongs to them uh, before he can take up his reign in his rightful inheritance. And so that's really what we've got here, this, this silence in heaven. And I want you to notice it really begins a section that will end uh, in chapter 11 and verse 15. And even though it has a quiet beginning, it has a very noisy ending. And if you look at chapter 11, verse 15, when the seventh angel sounded, so this silence is before the beginning of the first of the angels, the seven angels blowing their trumpets. In chapter 11, 15, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world uh, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The four and twenty elders, which before God on their seats fell upon their faces, worship God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, and so on and so forth. So I just want you to get the idea that this silence is prior to the the, the blowing of this, the first of the seven trumpets. And then there's a, a very noisy end with this outburst of praise because of the fact that it signals that Christ is about to take up his rightful place and reign on the earth in chapter 11, verse 15. So the silent sequence ends with great voices in heaven. Notice verse two, it says, I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So this is in connection with the seventh seal being opened. And we said that that these judgments, they're uh, what we'd say like a telescope. So that once the the seventh seal is opened, out of that comes seven angels with seven trumpets. When the seventh trumpet sounds, out of that comes the seven last plagues that are going to come, the vile or bold judgments. And so it, it's kind of like this, this uh, telescopic view we're, we're taking as we look at these scriptures. So again, seventh trumpet, uh, we just saw that chapter 11, when that is blown. And notice verse 19, we didn't see that, but it says in verse 19 of chapter 11, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. So again, there's the idea is this, that there's still more judgment to come. God's wrath has not completed uh, its purposes, and so there's more to come after the seventh angel sounds, and we'll observe that when we get to uh, chapter 16, uh, there's seven angels who are going to pour out their vials upon the earth. So we, we just want to observe that sequence of events. Seven trumpets are mentioned here. Another time in scripture where you have seven trumpets is in the book of Joshua. And if you remember the story of Joshua, uh, we want to look at Joshua chapter 6 and verse 4 where we find these reference to seven trumpets. And in this case, it's seven priests, not seven angels, but it says seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. In the seventh day, you shall compass the city seven times and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. And what did it mean, the blowing of those seven trumpets? Well, it meant judgment upon a wicked city had finally come. And so here we've got seven trumpets. And what it's saying is judgment on a wicked Christ rejecting world is come. Uh, and it's uh, uh, of course the Israelites had to be patient. They had to march around there seven times. And uh, God's people have been patient waiting uh, for this judgment, especially those martyrs who have prayed how long. Well, now the judgment is about to fall. So can you imagine this? We've had silence for half an hour, and the silence is about to be interrupted by the sounding of the blast of a trumpet. 
And certainly a trumpet sound would <laughs> certainly kind of startle people after 30 minutes of silence, the trumpet sounds. And so we're going to see these trumpet judgments. And what we're going to observe as we look at them, and they're blown by seven high officials in heaven, seven angels, angels of God. And that these judgments that, that are connected with the blowing of these seven trumpets are sterner in character than the previous ones. They have a more direct divine source, more supernatural in character. In other words, it's event is going to happen in heaven, the blowing of the trumpet, and then there will be cast down to the earth results as a result of these trumpets blowing. And so although all the judgments are under divine control, it seems that as we progress, God is turning up the temperature. He's turning up the heat on planet Earth, and the, the judgments are becoming more severe. And for one thing is for sure, these trumpets do not give an uncertain sound. <laughs> There's a very definite sound. And in the sound is God is judging. That's the sound. There's judgment on this earth. But before the judgment, there's an important little thing we need to see in verses three through five, and that is the service at the altar. And we want to see the connection here because these judgments, I believe, are in connection to the prayers of the saints. And so he notice he says in verse three, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, just a few things about this incident. First of all, I want to suggest to you that this angel is not Christ. Uh, many uh, zealous Bible student has tried to make it out that it's Christ in his high priestly ministry, and he's offering his incense, as it were, the incense fragrance of his life. Now, we're not saying it's, dis it's not connected with his fragrance, but we're, not, we're saying this angel is not Christ. I'm going to be quite dogmatic about this. And the reason is, I believe that since Christ took on humanity, he will never appear as an angel again. Uh, in the Old Testament, he often appeared as the angel of the Lord. But since the incarnation, he has taken on humanity and will will never appear in any other guise other than in that humanity that he took. And part of the evidence of that, it says, and another angel came. And that word another, you know, I'm sure well enough that in the Greek language, there's two words for another. There's the word that means another of the same kind, and there's the word that means another of a different kind. And without question, the word here is another of the same kind. So just like the seven angels that have gone before and that have been mentioned before, verse seven, verse two, I saw seven angels stand before God and another of the same kind of angel came and stood at the altar. And so quite clearly, uh, the, the thought is that it's an angel that is involved here at this altar. It's not Christ in his high priestly role in any way. And um, what, the angel has a twofold responsibility here. One is the presentation of the incense, and secondly, the pouring out of the fire, which we're going to see. Now, again, we, we also notice that we're, we're seeing quite a number of tabernacle references in the book of Revelation. We've already seen seven golden lampstands, which certainly is a reference back to the lampstand in the tabernacle. And then we've seen the throne of God. Of course, the throne of God would remind us of the Ark of the Covenant. And you say, well, isn't that a tenuous link? Well, let me just read from Psalm 99 verse 1 to show that there is a bearing, a definite connection. Um, because God reigns on his throne. And uh, Psalm 99 verse 1, it says, The Lord reigneth, but the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. And so the Ark of, a co of the Covenant is a picture of the throne of the Lord. And, and so we, we've seen the throne, which is reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant, the very place where God dwells, sitting between the cherubim, as it were, on his throne. And now we see the golden altar 
or the incense altar. And of course, we shouldn't be surprised because remember that Moses' tabernacle was made after the pattern of the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. <laughs> so the one on earth is just a copy of the true, and the true is the one that is in heaven. So we've got, we're got seeing tabernacle scenes, and we, we ought not to be surprised. And uh, there's some wonderful literature. I believe David Gooding has uh, got a, an excellent book on uh, the tabernacle in the book of Revelation. But again, we just want to observe that, that uh, we've got tabernacle pictures here. And so verse 4 says, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So we're reading about these prayers of the saints being offered with the incense. And again, there's a connection between incense and the prayers of the saints. Just as the prayers of the saints arise, so incense, when it's burned, arises. And so let's just look at, a, again, another reference in the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 141 and verse 2, Psalm 141, verse 2, this is David, we'll read from verse 1, Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me, give here unto my voice when I cry unto thee, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands at the evening sacrifice. So clearly a strong link between the prayers of the saints and incense ascending to God. And of course, we would say that when we pray, uh, certainly in the New Testament context, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so in a sense, that prayer is coming basically based on his authority. Uh, he's told us to ask things in his name, and it carries with it that lovely fragrance of the person of Christ. And so that's the idea of the incense, that fragrant life. Our prayers come we're, we're coming we're praying about his interests uh, we're praying in his name uh, we're praying because our, our love for him and the things connected with him and so it comes before god in the golden altar and it's good to know isn't it that our prayers as they come in his name find their place at the golden altar before god and just wonderful and there that christ of course does add his beautiful fragrance to our prayers makes them acceptable before god we might ask what prayers are involved here we've already mentioned it but we'd say it again that we have perhaps the prayers of the tribulation martyrs in chapter 6 verse 10 in view where they cried out in verse 10 of chapter 6 and, the, and cried with a loud voice saying how long O lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. So there's, there's that dimension. But also, we said that these this sequence is going to end with the, the that, that beautiful outcry in chapter 11, verse 15, that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. And so, again, we can't help but think that the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, verse 9 through 13, which has within it this idea, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven we'll see its final answer and so uh, the outpouring of the wrath of god connection with the tribulation martyrs how long before you judge and then the clearing out as it were of the earth dwellers so that the lord jesus can establish his millennial kingdom and finally god's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven and so verse 5, it says, the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, just a thought here. I'm not going to be dogmatic on this, but I wonder, do we have a second altar in view here? Because you know that the, the, the altar of incense was always lit by fire from the brazen altar. Of the altar of burnt sacrifice and so could it be that he again takes uh fire off the altar which is the altar of burnt sacrifice and he casts it to the earth and so again we've got to uh, go back to the old testament here and see 
that judgment is clearly in view with the casting call from the altar to the earth. And the book of Ezekiel uh, is a book of divine judgment coming upon the nation of, of Israel uh, and, or Judah because, because of their uh, worship of idols and their rejection of, of, of divine truth. And in Ezekiel 10, as this judgment is about to begin, uh, we see visions of the glory of God. And in chapter 10, verse 2, it says, And he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. So clearly it's a picture that divine judgment is in view here, casting it down to the earth. And notice uh, what happens here in chapter 8, verse 5, that when he does that, when he casts the fire from the altar to the earth, it says there were voices, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And we've, we've kind of mentioned this before, but it's good to remind ourselves that out of th these thunders and lightnings, where are they coming from? They're coming out of God's throne. Look at back at chapter 4, verse 5. It says, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. <laughs> and so, again, we, we, it's coming out of God's throne. The idea is this, that what was the throne of grace is now becoming a throne of judgment. And God is beginning to exercise judgment on the earth. And so we get to chapter 8, verse 5, and each time you see a reference to it, something additional added. So the first time in chapter 4, verse 5, we just see the lightnings, the thunderings, the voices. But here in chapter 8, verse 5, there's additions. And so it says, uh, there were voices and thunderings and lightning, and then an additional thing, an earthquake. So once this coal is cast to the earth, there's going to be a earthquake as a direct result of it. Look at chapter 11. Chapter 11. We've already looked a couple of times there. It says, The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So again, something more is added and then the last reference is going to be in chapter 16 when the the final judgments are poured out what we call the the bold judgments or the, the vile judgments and chapter 16 verse 18 there were voices and thunders and lightnings and then it says and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great, in fact, so so great, uh, it says, verse 19, the great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell. The great Babylon came in remembrance before God uh, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. So this is going to be some earthquake. The cities of the nations falling. Can you imagine that? Uh, this is going to be worldwide in effect cities of the nations falling uh, then uh, every island moving out of its place uh, and just amazing uh, sequence of events and of course great hail falling as well so we just see that again we just see this pattern god's wrath is being poured out but it's getting greater more intense as we go through the book and as the succeeding judgments come. As we begin to observe the outcome of these judgments that are mentioned in chapter 8, we want to just make a quick observation that one of the things that we're going to see is the phrase, the third part, is repeated throughout the judgments. So again, we see verse 7, it says, The first angel sounded, there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees. Uh, verse 8, again, we're going to have the third part of the sea. Verse 9, the third part of the creatures which were in the sea. Third part of the ships. Uh, verse 10, uh, the third part of the rivers. Uh, verse 11, 
uh, the, the wormwood, the third part of the waters became bitter. Uh, verse 12, <clears throat> again, the fourth angel sounded the third part of the sun and moon, part of the moon, the third part of the stars. So again, just all I want to see is just see this is another evidence of intensity increasing because when we were in Revelation chapter 6, we noticed that it was only a fourth part that was affected. It was 25% of the world was affected by the seal judgments. And so chapter 6, verse 8, I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on was in hell followed with him. And I was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, with the beasts of the earth. So it was 25% in the first half of the tribulation period of humanity was affected. But now we're in the trumpet judgments, and it's gone from 25% to 33%. And so when we get to the vile judgments, we're going to see that the intensity is even further. The entire earth is going to be affected. And so this is why we see the judgment is progressive rather than repeating the same thing three times over. But it's good to be reminded that although uh, the intensity is increasing, God is still sparing more than he is smiting. So if 25% in the first half die, that means there's still 75% left. And when again, 33% when we get to the trum trumpet judgments means that there's still more left than a perishing. And so we still see a measure of God in wrath, still remembering mercy. Not everyone is being wiped out at this time. We also are going to observe that these trumpet judgments, this is why we call this an, an environmental nightmare. The trumpet judgments are going to play havoc on the environment. Something that in recent history has become the object of man's worship. And I, I really believe this, it may not be popular, but I believe that climate change is a religion. I have no question in my mind, it is a religion. And it's connected with worshiping the earth, but also magnifying man as if man can solve all these problems. And um, again, just the perversity of man, that he hugs trees and at the same time murders babies. So far in the United States, 63 million babies have been murdered uh, in their womb. And so just the pure hypocrisy of man, uh, men trying to save a bug uh, and yet killing their own offspring. And so all that's held precious by the environmentalist lobby will come under the judgment of God. Again, God is going to show them, I can, I can really mess this planet up very, very easily. And at the end of it all, I can make it new again, just like I did the first time. I can make it more glorious than it ever was. And again, it's a reminder, God is on the throne. He is in control. And it's not about man. It's about him. It's about God. The, he is the, the creator. And he is the sustainer of all things. And so this is very much directed towards the environmentalist uh, lobby uh, that is so prevalent in our culture. And uh, and again, behind it is an agenda. Behind it is an agenda, and the end, the agenda is this global control. We want to control the world. It's all the mystery of iniquity. It's preparing the way for the man of sin. And uh, we can see it more clearly. I hope we can see it more clearly than ever. It depends on how much time we spend reading the word of God and how much time we spend watching the media will determine how we view these things. It's amazing how Christians can be influenced so much by the media that they actually lose their collective minds. <laughs> the truth of God must be preeminent in our minds here. And so he says in verse six, it says the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So they're getting ready to blow these trumpets. And then it tells us the first angel sounded verse seven, there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Now, let me just say this. There's absolutely no reason why 
we we should take these judgments in any other way than literal. And the reason I say that was the judgments on Egypt were literal. And we're going to see some definite parallels in these coming chapters between the judgment in the tribulation and the judgment on Egypt. And again, we're going to see that the judgments were directed at a proud Pharaoh. We're going to see that judgment is going to be directed ultimately uh, when we get to the final seven judgments against a proud ruler, the man of sin. So we're going to see uh, lots of parallels, but we're going to see it already even in this passage. We're going to see parallels between the judgments on Egypt. And again, we, we have to say the judgments on Egypt were literal physical judgments. The judgments here are going to be literal physical judgments. So what a scene. Imagine this. You're on planet Earth. Now, if you're a believer, you won't be here. <laughs> but but if, if you were there, just imagine what it would be like that all of a sudden hail and fire come down from heaven and a shower of blood. <laughs> that would... Uh, you talk about things that nightmares are made of, but it tells us there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And this, this storm, the meteorologists are going to have a very difficult time explaining this one. <laughs> Uh, they'll probably try and come up with some rational explanation, some naturalistic explanation, but they're going to have difficulty. The result of the storm will be this, that a third part of the trees would be burnt up and all green grass. And so, again, are we not reminded, as we've said already, of these plagues on Egypt? I want you just to look back to the book of Exodus and chapter 9. And although there's no mention directly of blood here there is elsewhere uh, the nile turned to blood and all the rest of it but i want us just to see uh, a parallel here exodus 9 verse 23 it says moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven and the lord sent thunder and hail and the fire ran along upon the ground and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. And there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb in the field and break every tree in the field. Now, again, that was a definite, literal judgment on Egypt. This will be one, but with a terrifying addition, a shower of blood added to that which was experienced in Egypt. And again, let me just focus our minds on this. The, the, there are real consequences to rejecting Christ. It tells us that a third of trees are being burned up. And are we not reminded that our Lord was crucified on a cruel tree? <laughs> We often sing, they nailed my Lord upon a tree and left him hanging there. And so, again, that Lord was crucified on a cruel tree. So a reminder of his rejection is seen in the succeeding judgments. And we'll point them out as we go through. But uh, there are consequences, huge consequences for rejecting Christ on this Christ-rejecting world. And so the one that was crucified on a tree, a third of all trees will perish as a result of it. In verse 8, the second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast to the sea, and the third of the sea became blood. So the second angel. Now notice this phrase, as it were. It's kind of a simile. Closest simile John can describe is that it's like a, a burning mountain. Now, we might say perhaps it's an asteroid or something like this crashing down through the Earth's atmosphere. And as a result of it, it turns a third part of the sea to blood with devastating consequences for both marine life and merchant shipping. 
Now, again, I was just in some research into this. I, I, I just thinking about meteorites and I uh, found a, an interesting article about in 1908, there was a, a meteorite that struck Siberia. It was 200 feet across or 61 meters. It struck Siberia. It dug a trench 30 to 40 miles long when it came to the earth and uh, or 48 to 64 kilometers in length. And when it came, it caused forest fires for miles around. And if you want to do some research yourself, it's called the, the Tunguska event, T-U-N-G-U-S-K-A, Tunguska event. And so we've seen kind of maybe foreshadowings of this kind of thing. And as a result of it, it tells us not only a third part of the sea became blood, a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. So again, what impact would that have if you took out a third of the, the sea stocks from the earth in terms of feeding people, for instance, one third of, of all uh, sea life gone. And then a third part of shipping. Now, again, just doing some research. And uh, currently, I'm told there are 118,000 ships, merchant ships, that are sailing around our world, delivering goods to our dining tables. One third of them would take out 39,000 ships taken out of the equation. Now, just think of this. Uh, we've recently um, experienced what we call the supply chain crisis because of COVID. And there was a time where it's not so bad now, but there were some empty shelves in our supermarkets. Can you imagine taking out of the equation a third of all current shipping, what that would do to the dinner tables in the world at that time. And so tremendous effects, both environmentally and economically, a third of sea life gone, a third of ships gone, a tremendous economic impact. And, you know, we look back to certain days, we think of September the 11th, we think of the COVID crisis. And of course, these, these days, we all kind of remember uh, the significance of these events, and, and it changed our world. What, what will the impact be of these trumpet judgments on the world? It's, it's going to put these staggering events in our lifetime, I mean, they're events we'll never forget, it's going to put them in the shadows. These events are going to are going to have a great effect. In fact, perhaps this approaching meteorite may be visible uh, for days, spreading terror behind, throughout the world. And, and then as it enters the atmosphere, they're causing this devastation. And again, the sea turned to blood. Again, a reminder that on the cross, the Lord Jesus, that tree, that cruel tree, he shed his innocent, precious blood for a world that is filled with ingratitude towards him. They still say, we don't want this man. We will not have this man. We don't want his gospel. We don't want his intrusion into our lives. We will not have him. And there are consequences for rejecting Christ. And we, we want to urge people, whoever might be listening to this, if you've never done that, this is critical. Uh, the importance of closing in on the offer of salvation. Notice verse 10, the third angel sounded. There fell a great star from heaven, burning, as it were, as a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Again, a star falling from heaven, this time with a name called Wormwood. And we, we were reminded in Luke's gospel, uh, chapter 21, that there, uh, there would be signs in the heavens. And we're seeing some of these signs. Uh, Luke 21, verse 11, where we read this. Uh, again, just the Lord's word. He says, great earth earthquakes shall be in diverse places, famines, pestilence, fearful sights, and great signs shall there be 
from heaven. And we're certainly witnessing here uh, in this text great signs from heaven. And again, the astronomers will become the experts of the moment on the morning talk shows, trying to explain the sudden upsurge in activity from outer space. Why? Why are we? Why this meteorite, and then meteorite, and then so soon afterwards? This uh, again, burning as a lamp. Uh, we might suggest a, a falling star as it hits the earth. It's evidently a, of a very poisonous nature, and a third of fresh water is made bitter, causing the death of many men. And again, imagine a third of fresh water taken out of the equation. Uh, how devastating that would be. And, it, and this wormwood, it's, it, we, we read it constantly in the word of God. Um, just let me just read a couple of references. We, we won't look at them all because there's so many of them, but it's always connected with a bitter experience. Uh, so we'll look at the, the book of Proverbs, for instance, chapter five and verse four. And, and again, there are many, many incidents in the scriptures that talk about this. But uh, in Proverbs 5, uh, it, it's talking about the, uh, the strange woman whose lips drop as a honeycomb and her mouth is smooth than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood. <laughs> and again, just the, that kind of a moral life has, a, has, a, has a, a not a very pleasant ending. But there are many references, and it's always connected with bitterness and sorrow, this idea of wormwood. And we see here that certainly it will be a both sorrowful and a bitter experience for planet Earth. People that drink these waters, uh, many of men drinking them will die. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that there is, a again, a, a little kind of veiled reference here. I want us to go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 15. You probably may even be thinking of this lovely story yourself. But in verse 22 of Exodus 15, it says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness with Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And of course, our lives were often filled with bitterness and disappointment. And everything changed when he showed us a tree, <laughs> when he showed us the one crucified on the center cross. And of course, the cross can turn life's bitternesses into sweetness and again are we not reminded here that the lord himself drank a bitter cup on calvary and of course one of his cries from the cross was i thirst now man will also experience both a bitterness and a thirst because of the folly of rejecting the one who could have made the bitter water sweet for them there are great fears expressed today about potential water shortages and pollution of the oceans. And what will men of this day say? Surely hearts will be gripped with fear. And so it says in verse 12, the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and third part of the stars. So the third part of them was dark and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise so fourth trumpet sounds fourth angel sounds and men will seek to explain away these three previous judgments as mere natural disasters without any divine linkage but now god touches the sky and will show how inadequate these naturalistic explanations really were the heavenly bodies to men seem so untouchable, part of the, their 
uniform system. They're willfully ignorant of the fact that divine intervention has occurred in the past. They have this uniformitarianism that everything continues as it always did. And suddenly seeing the what seems to be stable, the heavenly sphere, uh, now uh, during the day, there will be a partial eclipse of the sun during the day, robbing people of a third of sunlight. And the moon at night, a third of the uh, moon will not be seen. So again, they, they, when the moon lights up the sky, and, and again, a third of it will be, will be taken out of the equation. And then, of course, a third of the stars. And again, you can imagine Hubble telescope trying to figure out what's going on here. What's, what is all this about? And again, we, we again say it, it has to be literal. And we go back to the book of Exodus and the plagues of Egypt. And of course, we even can go back to Calvary too, uh, that God is able to supernaturally draw the shades from the sky without a problem. Exodus 10, verse 21, it says, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out thy hand toward heaven and there that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. There was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. And again, we saw Calvary uh, during those three hours of darkness. Again, God is able to pull the shades. And so, uh, again, we're reminded. Uh, I want to go back to the book of Joel just for a moment. And uh, this day of the Lord and what, what it's about and some of the things in connection with it. And we notice in Joel and chapter 2, and the first two verses, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. What kind of a day is that going to be? A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And so again, we see this, a land of gloominess, a land of darkness. How dark indeed. Nature suffer, um, not only will nature suffer loss, but no doubt, if there's more darkness, what usually happens during the dark? Isn't that where sin often takes place? Isn't it what the Lord says? Everyone that doeth evil hates the light. And what do they do? When do they do their deeds? They do them in the night. And so, again, with this darkness, uh, along with it, no question about it, will be an, uh, a, a kind of a, a eclipse of sin uh, because of the added hours of darkness. And again, are we also not reminded once more of Calvary and the three hours of darkness that surrounded the crucifixion of our blessed Lord when the sinless one was made to be sin for us. And so we, we just see, again, there's, there, there are consequences for rejecting Christ. This Christ-rejecting world, right now we're in a day of grace, but that day of grace is fast coming to an end. And the throne of grace, as we've seen, is going to become a throne of judgment. And there's going to be lightnings and thunderings and, and earthquakes and all the rest of it. And so there's going to be tremendous impact. And we get to verse 13. And we notice it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So we have a, a little short interlude here. The final three trump, trumpets are also known as woes. Remember we said that the, this little pattern, that there's seven judgments, but they divide into fours and threes. And we saw that with the seals. The first four were the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The last three were not. Now, we're seeing seven judgments. The first four are clearly on the environment, but the last three are called woe judgments. And of course, perhaps the idea is that they're going to result in a cry from the earth, woe, 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 woe to the inhabitants of the earth. 
this technical term, the inhabitants of the earth, the earth dwellers. These are the ones who are saying and have consistently said, we will not have this man to reign over us. This is our world. We don't want his intervention. We, we, we want a naturalistic world where there is absolutely no room for God or his Christ. And so these are people who are claiming the earth for their own. And as a result of it, woes are pronounced. And it will produce woes from the inhabitants of the earth. Now, these three woes refer to the judgments yet to come when the re remaining three angels blow their trumpets. And it's as if the, the messenger is saying this. If you think it has been terrible up to now, just wait. Worse is yet to come. And that's really what's coming to the planet Earth. These three series of judgments, all seven in number, all will be divided into four and three, and all was progressively greater. The first four ju judgments are on the environment, the Earth. The three war judgments are on the inhabitants of the Earth. It's actually going to not so much touch the environment, but touch the men on the earth, the earth dwellers. Two of these woes are connected to invasions. The first two in chapter nine will be two invasions. There's an invasion from the abyss and it will produce distress for men. Five months of torment for men on the earth. The invasion from the abyss. And then there's going to be an invasion from the east in the second half of chapter 9 from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. And this invasion from the east, if the first invasion brought distress to men, the second invasion will bring death to men. And we're going to see a tremendous impact when a third part of men will be killed. And so we might say, in one sense, although this is a very sobering chapter and, and a very uh, devastating chapter for, for planet Earth, uh, we would say this, it, it gets worse before it gets better. And it does get worse before it gets better. In fact, at the end of it all, one will wonder, will anyone survive? <laughs> That's why we had chapter seven. Yes, there will be those that will survive. There will be those that are left standing, but it's going to get to the point where people will wonder, can man even survive? And if it wasn't for God's sealed ones and the resultant gospel labors of them, it would be true. Very few would survive, but they will. And again, it will be a mark of the fact that in, in God's wrath, he still remembers mercy. So may the Lord stir our hearts as we think of these things these things are very real they're yet to occur on planet earth it should at least stir us to be more prayerful uh, more burdened to reach out to lost sinners amen